U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to review the Colorado ruling that bars former President Donald Trump from the state's ballot over his role in the January 6, 2021 Capitol attack. Trump has also appealed a similar decision by Maine's Democratic Secretary of State. The justices will hear the case on February 8th. Now, if the ruling is upheld, it will be the first time in the history of the United States. The Colorado Supreme Court had ruled last month that Trump is ineligible to appear on the primary ballot because of the U.S. Constitution's 14th Amendment. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment bars anyone from holding public office if they engage in quote-unquote insurrection or rebellion. Now this after once pledging to support and defend the Constitution. The Iraqi government has started the process of removing the US-led international military coalition from the country. Now this announcement comes in the wake of a US strike in Baghdad this week. The strike claimed the life of a pro-Iran military commander, sparking anger among Iran-aligned groups. These groups have been demanding an end to the presence of the international coalition in Iraq. The Iraqi Prime Minister is also facing internal pressure from powerful Shiite parties close to Iran, pushing for the removal of the US presence. In response, Iraqi Prime Minister's office also released a statement saying the government is establishing a committee to arrange the permanent exit of these international forces. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has arrived in Turkey, his first stop in the week-long New West Asia trip. This is U.S. top dipl diplomat's fourth crisis visit to the region amid escalating tensions. Blinken landed in Istanbul on Friday for talks with Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan and President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Though a crucial NATO ally, Turkey, Turkey has been one of the harshest critics of U.S. support for Israel in the ongoing war. Blinken will also discuss NATO expansion in Turkey. He is also due to visit Israel, the West Bank, Jordan, Qatar, the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, as well as Greece during this trip. Now, Blinken has used his previous trips for ceasefire talks and to prevent the spillover of the war. However, this time he returns to the region that has, been, that has seen attacks in or from Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, Syria and Iran. Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah has issued fresh warning of retaliation against Israel after killing Hamas deputy chief Salah al-Aruri in Beirut. He says Lebanon would be exposed to more Israeli operations if his militant group does not respond. Now the Hamas leader al-Aruri was killed in a drone strike on a southern suburb of Beirut on Tuesday. Hezbollah and Hamas have blamed Israel for his death, but Israel has not claimed responsibility. Nasrallah also added that fighting in Gaza could present a quote-unquote historic opportunity for Lebanon to restore its control over territory that were occupied by Israel during the 1967 Arab-Israeli war. Now, shortly after Hamas's October 7th attack, Hezbollah started firing rockets towards Israel. Tensions have been escalating since then on the Israel-Lebanon border. The death of Hamas Deputy Chief Salah al-Aruri has sparked protests in Palestine. Thousands are gathering in his hometown in West Bank and are marching to demand a revenge. Protests are taking place in Arura in West Bank, which is al-Aruri's hometown. People have been demonstrating, holding Palestine's and Hamas's flags. 
several Palestinians are also taking to streets in Ramallah to protest against the Israeli attacks in Gaza. Large crowds are also gathering in Yemeni capital of Sana'a. Now, Houthi supporters are rallying here in solidarity with Gaza. The rebel group has warned they will target ships in the Red Sea that have links to Israel. Several of the missiles and drones have been shot down by US, French and British warships in recent work in weeks. Missile remnants found in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv appear to be from North Korea. The conclusions came a day after the United States said Russia had fired North Korean short-range ballistic missiles at Ukraine. Now, Ukraine also said that Russia had struck Kyiv with missiles from Pyongyang for the first time, although it did not provide any evidence. North Korea has been under a United Nations arms embargo since it first tested a nuclear bomb in 2006. UN Security Council's resolutions approved with Russian support ban countries from trading weapons or other military equipment with North Korea. Now both Moscow and Pyongyang have previously denied conducting any arms deals but bowed last year to deepen military relations. South Korean residents from two remote islands on the western maritime frontier evacuated to a bomb shelter amid North Korean firing. North Korea has fired over 2,000 rounds, uh, 200, I beg your pardon, rounds of artillery shells into the sea near the tense maritime border. Seoul has called the aggression a quote-unquote an act of provocation. North Korea, on the other hand, says that its coastal units fired 192 rounds as a quote-unquote natural response to South Korea's military actions. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has sent messages of sympathy to the leaders of Iran and Japan. This after the countries were hit with deadly bombings and earthquake, respectively, this week. Two bomb blasts in Iran claimed by Islamic State nearly killed 100 people on Wednesday, while the death toll in Japan's devastating earthquake on New Year's Day has risen to 110. Now, according to the state media, Kim expressed condolences to Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida with the hope that affected areas would be restored to stability soon. He also expressed sympathy to the Iranian president, Ibrahim Raisi, and reaffirmed North Korea's stand, quote-unquote, in opposing all sorts of terrorism. <laughs> After a strong 7.6 magnitude earthquake jolted Japan, the death toll has now risen to 110. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has said that scores of people are still feared trapped under the rubble. While the country's disaster preparation and recovery methods are being tested, the United States is readying military logistics and aid support. As per reports, the insured losses from the devastating earthquake can touch $6.4 billion. Of this mammoth cost, over two-thirds are accounted by losses of residential properties. The Indian Navy has rescued the crew of a Liberian flagged merchant vessel. Now, all 21 crew members, including Indians, aboard the cargo ship have been rescued and are safe. This comes after the vessel was attempted to be hijacked in the Arabian Sea. Now, the Indian Navy has reportedly not found any pirates on board the vessel. The rescue effort follows 
an interception by an Indian Navy warship after it received a report that the MV Leela Norfolk has been hijacked. The vessel was hijacked 460 nautical miles off the coast of Somalia. The crew of the ship had gathered in the ship's stern when five to six armed individuals boarded the vessel on Thursday. According to the British maritime security firm Ambre, the vessel was destined for Khalifa bin Salman in Bahrain. It was not immediately clear what it was carrying. Eight former Indian naval officers who were earlier sentenced to death in Qatar now face prison sentences of varying lengths. The men have 60 days to appeal the jail term. Last month, a court in Qatar had commuted their death penalties. Neither Qatar nor India have revealed the specific charges against the men. However, men have been reportedly charged with spying for Israel. India, Qatar and Israel have not commented on this. The court orders in the matter have also not been made public. India has been issuing statements about the major developments in the case, which was seen as a diplomatic test for the government. In the heated race to the US presidential elections, accusations fly as both parties point fingers at each other. President Biden used his first campaign event of 2024 to call out his likely opponent, the former president Donald Trump, for the threat he poses to American democracy. Joe Biden has accused his opponent, Donald Trump, of echoing Nazi Germany. Clearly, the political rhetoric is rising and there is no love lost from the former US president as well. Trump, known for his blusters, called out the sitting US president. Trump has been has accused Biden of being a fear mongerer. <laughs> News coming in from Bangladesh an alleged case of arson aboard a Dhaka-bound train late Friday night has claimed five lives. The intercity train was carrying 292 passengers from the border district of Jessore to the capital city of Dhaka. Most of the passengers on board were returning for the national polls scheduled tomorrow. Many from work across the shared border with India. The train was on its way to Dhaka's main railway terminal when it caught fire while passing through the city's Gopi Bag residential area. Three coaches of the Benapol Express were left completely charred, with damage extending to two more. According to rescuers on the scene, hundreds of people bearing witness to the burning train rushed to pull passengers out from the affected bogies. On the other hand, Britain woke up to major floods in the Midlands region. Hundreds of homes have been devastated after a powerful storm and a week of heavy rainfall battered the country. With over 300 flood warnings in force, residents in Midlands, East Anglia and Southern England are now forced to evacuate. At least a thousand homes have suffered damages so far. The Environment Agency says, that it expects more rain in the next 24 hours and for river levels to remain high until Sunday, that is, until January 7th. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said he recognized the intensity of the impact of flooding and advised residents living in the affected areas to follow government-issued warnings. Sunak assured hundreds of high-volume pumps are being used to remove the stagnant water.
there's a big merger in the works in the energy sector, one that can revamp the global natural gas business in the United States. Now, natural gas producer Chesapeake Energy and Southwestern Energy are close to finalizing a merger deal. The merger could create a nearly $17 billion company. Reports say that the deal could come together as soon as next week. But it depends on talks not falling apart. A potential deal could create a company that would overtake EQT as the largest natural gas focused exploration and production firm in the United States. Now, amid sluggish natural gas prices, shale companies are seeking scale and efficiency. U.S. natural gas futures ended 2023 with the biggest percentage decline since 2006. That was due to record production, ample inventories and a mild winter. McDonald's CEO Chris Kemzinki has blamed misinformation for its losses. As the boycott movement against Western brands continues amid the Israel-Hamas war, Kemzinki's re revealed that West Asia sales have been hit by misinformation about the fast food giant's position on the Israel-Hamas war. He calls such misinformation disheartening and ill-founded. The company in the past had said it does not take sides in the conflict. He added that McDonald's stands in solidarity with those affected by the war and that it abhors violence and stands against hate speech. The boycott, disvest, divestment, sanctions movement has urged people to reject McDonald's due to its alleged support of the Israeli military. Spillover effects of the Russia and Ukraine war are being witnessed by the South Asian country of Nepal. The Himalayan nation has stopped issuing work permits to its citizens for working in Russia and Ukraine till further notice. This comes after at least 10 Nepali soldiers were killed while serving in the Russian army. Nepal has asked Russia not to recruit its citizens in the Russian army and to immediately send back all Nepali soldiers and also compensate the, family of the, the families of those killed. According to reports, 200 Nepali citizens are estimated to be working in the Russian army. Nepal's foreign minister, N.P. Saud, has said about 100 Nepalis are missing. Reputed for their fighting skills, Nepali soldiers, known as Gurkhas, are serving the British and the Indian armies since India's independence in 1947. The Indian economy is set to remain the world's growth engine this year. The latest government estimate puts India's growth at 7.3% for the current fiscal ending in March. The latest estimate puts India on top of the fastest growing large economies. In 2023, the advanced estimates pegged India's growth rate at 7.2%. India's economy is projected to reach $3.57 trillion by March 31st. The economy stood at $3.28 trillion in March last year. The higher advanced estimate comes on the back of robust growth in all major sectors of the economy. The construction sector in particular is estimated to grow by over 10% in 2023-24. All sectors are expected to grow by 6% in the current fiscal year. The agriculture and allied sector is an exception though as it is likely to grow by just 1.8%.